Good morning, Nigeria, and welcome to Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. My name is Ayuba Ilya, and of course, we are glad to have you join the show this morning. Here we bring you analysis and perspectives on national issues of concern and all the current affairs that you need to know for you to make your decision. So you can trust us with just, not just the news, but also with perspectives from experts uh, here on the show. Welcome to the program. My name is Zainab Bala, and we are super excited to be here. Mm, true. Today is uh, Tuesday, the 11th of uh, January, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, quite a number of issues. The central bank is raising alarm, you know, over the borrowings of the federal government and its impact on monetary policy. And so uh, we'll be having economic experts in the studio to talk about that. And uh, we also have in the studio uh, Sunday Michael, Daily Trust uh, Deputy Business Editor, uh, to give us perspectives also on the stories that are on the front pages of our newspapers. As you may all be aware, the former governor of Lagos State, Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, is contesting for the 2023 presidential election. Um, I guess it's not a news. It's not, it's not in the news because it's something that a lot of people, uh, we've had that speculation for yeah, quite a, a while, rumors, even before. And now it has been fully confirmed and we really look forward to seeing how that turns out. Mm -hmm. So we'll be getting perspectives on that. Uh, our political editor uh, here, uh, well, political editor? No. Uh, the uh, deputy editor-in-chief will be joining us uh, to give perspectives on this uh, story. For now, let's take a look at the news highlights. Okay, uh, we'll begin with the governor of Yobe State, Maimala Buni, has lifted the ban on the use of motorcycles across 10 local government areas of Yobe North and South Senatorial District in the state. Now, the governor made the announcement at the Emir of Nguru's Palace while commiserating with residents over the recent fire incident at Nguru Market. He noted that residents are now free to use their motorcycle for easy access to their farms, among other legitimate purposes, explaining that the new measure is as a result of improvement in security situation witnessed in those areas. Recall that the state government banned the use of motorcycle in January 2012 during the peak of Boko Haram crisis. Communities to use motorbikes now include Bade, Nguru, Karusawa, Yusufari, Mashina, Jakusko, Fune, Fika, Nangere, and Potiskum local government areas, respectively. All right. The reconciliation committee set up by the national leadership of the All Progressives Congress has assured of its readiness and determination to reconcile all aggrieved members and bring lasting peace to the party. The chairman of the committee, Abdul, Abdullah Adamu, gave the assurance while meeting with Kwara State Governor in his office as part of mandate given to the committee to find lasting solution to the crisis in the state. Now, he noted that the petitions submitted by those aggrieved will be looked into, invite both parties and be fair and just in its report to ensure the sustainability of the unity of the party without compromising the sanctity of the party. Now, the state governor on his part promised to collaborate with the committee in finding a lasting peace to the party in the state. The ones that are complaining, the government is our government. It's an APC government. And uh, anything that will rock or threaten the stability of this uh, ship of state, we will take every precaution to ensure that we discourage that, we frustrate that. It is my intention, it is our hope as a committee, that those who are petitioning are well intended, they have uh, good cause for the petitions they have written, we will listen to them. Uh, and I uh, want to assure you, Your Excellency, and the government of APC in this state, that we will not accept anything that is planted just to discredit. 
Elsewhere, commercial tricycle riders in Kano State suspend operation after government commands and Recently, the Kano State Road Traffic Agency permit. Trust TV's correspondent Idris Jabir reports that the action forced residents and other commuters to move on foot to their various places of work and businesses. Kano State Road Traffic Agency commands renewal of operation permit for all commercial tricycle operators across the state failure of which will lead to additional penalty or permanent suspension of operation. However, Tricycle Riders believes that the renewal of the operation permit at the cost of 8,000 Naira is too much for them to afford. You see, this strike by our members is largely due to the issue of operating permit that the state government, uh, particularly Karuta, asked us to pay. Initially, uh, when you have a new tricycle, you pay uh, 19,000 Naira. When it is new, you have, or uh, when it is old, uh, you have to renew it uh, at the cost of uh, 8,000 Naira, which is uh, annual uh, something that we are doing. But our members are complaining that this money is too much for them. The government should reduce it to at least um, uh, 4,000 Naira or 5,000 Naira in such a way that they can be able to afford. But the government is not ready to listen to us. Uh, so this is why uh, we decided to suspend operation pending when we complete negotiation with the government so that we can be able to return to work. But it is not our intention to, to go and stay at home just like that. According to the managing director of Kano Road Traffic Agency, Bapa Badang Agundi, the amount was initially 100,000 Naira, but the state governor slashed it down to enable all operators to pay. He said his agency is collaborating with the leadership of their union okay, like to resolve the ongoing said, um, strike. It is about uh, the operational permit, which they are supposed to renew for 2022. Uh, they don't want to do that, even though some of them have done it, but a lot of them don't want to do it. Uh, because they don't want to respect the law, they don't want to pay revenues to the government. They think the security they are getting to operate in the state is for free. Uh, all the peace we have within the state, they think is for free. All this thing that you see that is happening in Kano, as the most peaceful state, we thank God for that. Uh, it is because of the prayers and the airport made by the governor. Meanwhile, commuters in Kano have resorted to traveling on foot due to the absence of tricycles on the road as they equally ask government to find a lasting solution to the problem. I think the problem of these uh, tricycle riders is the problem of government. Government is not expected to put pressure on these uh, young boys. Government supposed to come in and see how they can be able to help these boys so that they can continue doing their business instead of collecting a uh, heavy tax like this one. Honestly, we are not happy with this uh, strike by tricycle riders. We have to go to our places of work, we can't. We have to travel to the market, we can't. Because right now, like you can see, many people are working uh, uh, with food, with their food, with their, they are working on food. And this is because the tricycle riders have uh, resorted to suspend their operation. Last year, the same tricycle riders protested in Kano over what they call an increase in daily taxation and alleged extortion by officers of the State Road Traffic Agency. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kano. All right, let, now let's take a look at some sports news. Super Eagles on Monday debunked reports that a fight broke out in its camp. The team, via its official Instagram handle, said the players were only having fun. Earlier, a mild drama at Super Eagles camp in Cameroon went viral as attacker Kelechi Ehenacho in a recorded video dragged Henry Onyekuru near an elevator holding each other, which generated reactions from Nigerians. Nigeria will take on seven-time champions Egypt, Sudan and debutants Guinea-Bissau in, in the group phase of their 19th appearance in the Africa Cup of Nations with the state Ramond Ajia in Garo as the venue for all their matches. Okay, now let's take a look at the historical events of the 7th 
uh, of January in world history. 11th rather, sorry. Thank you for staying with us. Now, going straight into the newspaper review, we have in the studio Sunday Michael, Deputy Business Editor of Daily Trust, and he'll be giving us perspectives on the stories that make the headlines. Now, let's begin with a Daily Trust newspaper, and here you would find the lead story. Like we told you earlier, Tinubu to Buhari, I want to succeed you. And then it has the writers that says, nothing stops Kingmaker from becoming king. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> interesting way to capture, you know, that. Uh, you also have nobody will get a ticket on a silver platter. That's according to the APC. There can't be only one aspirant, Professor Osimbajo Group. It's a smart move, that's uh, according to Don, a political scientist, I believe. Uh, also, uh, the pictorial there shows the commuters stranded on Kano Street as tricycle riders embarked on strike uh, yesterday. Now, for a state like Kano, uh, for tricycle riders to go on strike, you know definitely that's going to have a devastating, uh, a devastating, you know, uh, implication uh, because it's heavily mode of transportation uh, there is heavily dependent on tricycle okay. riders. So uh, whatever the issue is, please, I think it should be resolved as soon as possible to uh, avert this suffering, you know, on a kind of residence. Now, the next one, uh, Keke riders lose over 300 million Naira in one day strike in Kano. So you can see that Huge. even the government is not is going to be losing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes. At the bottom of that uh, paper, that's the Daily Trust, you would see a standard chartered to shut half of Nigerian branches, and, and that is found on page 7. Uh, kidnapping. Fish farmers abandon farms in Kwara. Uh, the story on page 28. And you have Nigeria, Greece, sign MOU on economy and security. So these are the major stories on the front page of the Daily Trust today. Okay, let's take a look at all the stories on the Blueprint newspaper. Uh, the Blueprint is also leading with a story about Bola Tinubu on 2023, becoming Nigeria's president, my lifelong ambition. Wow, quite interesting. Um, and the writer there says, I've told Buhari I'm running promises to make public declarations soon. Uh, 57 youth groups back Oshibaja to mobilize 5 million voters. North won't cede power to South through blackmail, ex Buhari's aid. Uh, you'd also see uh, other stories there. Troops foil attack, kill five bandits in Kaduna villages. A fresh attack claims one life in just one in Plateau. And a CDC moves to sanitize private security industry. Uh, you'd also see on the Blueprint newspaper this morning, um, 
Mali coup, ECOWAS leaders close borders, recall envoys, freeze assets. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, JNI, Mons Fountain of Knowledge, Golden Hadith narrator. Uh, you'd also see uh, PSAN pickets NAS over minimum wage, come peculiar allowances. Uh, you'd also see the story on page 7 about MPC ready to conduct first digital population census May 2022. That's according to the MPC boss. Uh, so these are some of the major stories on the Blueprint newspaper. All right. Now, I take a look at um, uh, the Punch newspaper this morning. The lead story there says, Ohaneze Fumes alleges injustice as Tinubu declares presidential bid. Uh, then you have the writers there. I have informed Buhari of my ambition. He did not ask me to stop, says APC leader. Tinubu presidential ambition not rooted in equity, justice, it's Igbo's turn. That's according to Ohanese. There we go again. Uh, well, the pictorial there shows you parliamentary workers, uh, picket National Assembly, protest on paid salaries and allowances. And then below that you will also see APC picks January 27 for Akiti governorship primary, Army arrest soldier for alleged assault on Oyo traffic uh, wardens. Yeah, yesterday that video went viral uh, on social media. A very embarrassing and uh, disappointing scene. Mm -hmm. Ekiti sale boy disguises, threatens boss with kidnap, demands 1.5 million naira. And then at the bottom of the punch newspaper, Kwankwaso rubbishes zoning begins consultations on 2023 presidential election. And then suspected cultists tie Lagos casino attendants' hands, stab victim to death. And then you see also FRSC begins enforcement of speed limiter, arrest seven motorists. Uh, the stories at the top there says PNID firm paid $9,969 into director daughter's account before agreeing agreement signing that's according to witness uh, the next one devalue currency further raise interest rates imf tells nigeria and others efcc rearrest momfa for alleged uh, 32.9 billion naira money laundering and then disco's indebtedness hits uh, 326 billion naira in nine months, says the federal government. These are the stories on the front page of the punch today. Okay, let's take a look at all the stories on the nation newspaper. Um, it seems most of the newspapers are leading with a story about Tinubu's beat. It states here on the nation newspaper, Tinubu, my presidential ambition, a lifelong dream. Uh, APC stalwart intimates president on beat to run. Uh, you see all the stories. Marking Day promises befitting funeral for Son. So uh, 90 arrested at Lagos Airport for fake COVID-19 certificates. Here we go again. Uh, you find the details of that story on page 28 on the Nation newspaper. Um, you also see Jam tells Varsity's police to conclude 2021 admission. Hope not lost for Leah Sharibu's rescue, says uh, the Nigerian military. Uh, you'd also see Nigeria faces testy tie against Egypt uh, in Afghan. Uh, these are some of the major stories on the nation newspaper. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the Guardian is next. And here you have uh, the lead story, the same talking about Tinubu confirms presidential ambition. You know, says, I'm a kingmaker, I want to be king. Uh, the writers there says, Tinubu, I've informed Buhari of my lifelong ambition to be president. He has what it takes to be president, says YCE Secretary General. Uh, coalition of 57 youth groups endorses Osibanjo as Buhari's successor. Only PDP can rescue Nigeria, says Diri Wiki. Why PDP must not zone Nigeria's presidency to the south? That's according to Kwankwaso. 
And then there, the next story there, beside the pictorial, Lagos forecloses plans to seal schools over resumption date. Troops kill five bandits for a kidnap attempt in Kaduna. And then gunmen abduct ex-assembly speaker for others in Imo State. These are the stories on the front page of The Guardian uh, this morning. Um, let's get perspectives on these stories. And uh, like we told you, we have Sunday Michael, Deputy Business Editor of the Trust. Good morning. Welcome to Daybreak. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here again. Mm -hmm. All right. Let, let's begin with uh, maybe some more economical stories. Uh, first, uh, talking about the Kano State situation. Mm -hmm. uh, KK riders, you know, are on strike. And already we are recording loss of about 300 million naira in Kano. <laughs> What's the implication of this uh, strike? The implication is huge, as um, you would have seen even in the, in the headline. Um, it's, it's a loss not just to the riders alone, but even to government. You cannot begin to quantify in monetary terms the actual loss to the average um, commuter. I mean, uh, some of the testimonies yesterday was that even janitors who worked in corporate offices could not access those places. So you can imagine what corporate offices looked like yesterday, mm. or even government offices, if you like. Um, people who needed to travel, people whose business it is to move light goods from point A to point B, uh, do all of these things on um, on the Kekena Pep rather than a bike, you know, uh, which put them even at more risk. And so it's it's huge. Uh, Kanu is reputed to have anywhere between seventy to one hundred thousand keke on a daily basis. So if you multiply that by the average number of people they ferry from point A to B, even a hundred thousand people in a day is, is, is a colossal, that is if, imagine that they, they pick just one person in a day. Mm. If you multiply that by, let's say five persons to a KK, you are talking about over 500,000 people stranded. Uh, for a city like Kanu, with all its bustling economic activities, that was a massive, massive, massive disruption, you know, so. Uh, it's huge. Uh, whatever it is, I hope the authorities move swiftly uh, because that state cannot continue to to tolerate this kind of massive. Maybe they took it for granted the amount of impact that these persons have on, on economic activity. You know, uh, the GDP of the state would have suffered gravely yesterday, especially as it affects the middle to the lower income. Uh, strata of the society and if that's if you demobilize that aspect of society then the services they provide to the upper the middle upper class would also be completely uh, disrupted you know so the implication is really very huge so what, what really should Karuta have done differently you know to address the issue rather than I, just I hiking I part? think um, yeah. there is no limit to engaging dialogue rather than sit and arrogate to yourself the power to to make pronouncements that disrupt that have grave implications for livelihood remember that these bikers pay the hundred thousand minimum ticket i mean a hundred naira minimum ticket every day to government mm -hmm. now if they cross into any municipal, uh, municipal area within canada that is moving from one local government to another they pay additional 50,000, um, 50 naira. On the average, some of these Keke guys cross anywhere between two or four of those local governments because it's a very big city, right? Mm -hmm. And so for those kind of persons, they pay about around 300 naira to the government daily. Remember that some of these Keke are actually taken up on higher purchases. So you net 300 naira off, they have to do some fueling, some cases they have to do some repairs mm -hmm. and they have to make their daily return to the owners of this bike. So you are to come up with an increase in, in, their, in their renewal, their papers or whatever, is to exert more pressure on an average person who is already struggling to meet what you already have as existing payment. And let us not forget, these guys are Nigerian, so everything we are talking about increments in the cost of gas, uh, VAT, I mean, they suffer these things. The <laughs> removal of fuel subsidy. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, they basically were saying this, these prices are beyond what we can afford. It will exert so much uh, pressure on us. And it was one way of getting the government people to say, see, if you are not willing to come to the table, 
we can also cause some disruption to the economy. And I think that was very clear mm -hmm. yesterday, the kind of statements that they made. And to think that at least 20 to 40 percent of students in public school within the municipal area council go to school with the aid of KK, right? Because, in, I mean, in the failure of public transport, organized public transport mm -hmm. system, because you can imagine the impact it had on schools alone. You know, to the extent that even a university had to postpone his, uh, its examinations because students were unable to make it to the school for examination. So, I mean, if you continue, then you'll be talking about women who, were, I mean, uh, implication for even maternal mortality because mm -hmm. women would be under their situations to get to the hospital. You can't take them, ferry them on a bike. Maybe the closest thing to an ambulance you can have is a KK and it is also not available. So it's, if we keep, if this, you know, goes beyond what they did yesterday, we may begin to track implications for other sectors. Mm. All right, well, very interesting uh, stories there. We are seeing also an advice by the IMF now uh, telling Nigeria to devalue currency further and raise the interest rate. Uh, is this a wise counsel? <laughs> uh, the IMS has always um, taken this position. Um, so it's not strange for anybody who has been following the trajectory. Uh, they keep justifying the fact that they feel that our currency is still um, overpriced. Mm -hmm. They think we have not been able to find the equilibrium for what is a reasonable exchange rate currently. Um, and the, all the IMF economists, as the case may be, have all kinds of justification for making this call. But we also have a sovereign state to run with its own institutions, uh, with its own economic. The CBN, for instance, has over 200 PhD holders in its, in its coffers. Uh, people who are specialists in microeconomic uh, situations coming up with all kinds of analysis on what they think it is fair. So on the one hand, you are battling with price. On the, on the other hand, you are battling with uh, shortage in exchange rate control. Uh, and on the other hand, you are trying to also encourage bo uh, lending to the real sector. So if you raise interest rate as these people are clamoring for, you make credit very expensive, then it means organization who ought to have taken credit to expand manufacturing operations will not do so because the cost of paying back would just be way out of the roof, right? That's the dilemma they are, they, are, they, are, they are contending with because you cannot be really not policies that will be counterproductive to your economic growth and survival. Uh, and so on the other, on the other hand, you, you want to raise a dollar exchange rate. Remember, most of our companies also have to depend on spare parts imported. We are a huge, huge import dependent country. So you jack that up, exchange rate, naturally will shoot up. This organization would then have to source more Naira to get dollars to bring in spare parts or raw materials for their factories or even the pharmaceuticals to bring in raw materials for drugs. Mm -hmm. And you know what they will do naturally? They will pass it down to me and you. And because whatever they do to afford it, they will simply raise prices. Uh, today we are beginning to see a bottle of uh, carbonated drink shrink uh, you know, to the size of a cough syrup, <laughs> you know, and the prices are not dropping, yeah. you know, so they will begin to come up with ingenious ways uh, to remain in the market, cut size of product, cut quality of product, cut, you know, and then jack prices at the same time. That is the implication for some of these things. So uh, that is why, you know, at the extent, at the expense of um, whatever reasoning may have informed the IMF call, there is a lot of caution from our own monetary and fiscal authorities on how they swallow these pills hook, line, and sinker. Okay, now we are also seeing um, parliamentary workers uh, protest on paid salaries and allowances. Well, some would say this might not be the right time for them to actually protest. Uh, if you have to pay school fees in January, <laughs> you, <laughs> you begin to wonder whether it's the right time. I mean, the... the, the the bills are not sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, for some persons, their rent also expire. I mean, I, I got a notification in one of my 
places where I stay. I mean, a jack of about 50% uh, increase in rent. And I was saying to myself, is, is this people, are these people sensitive at all? Is it, does it feel like a good? Mm -hmm. But I also remember that the landlord also operated this economy. He's got <laughs> bills he has to pay. And the only means of uh, raising these finances is to depend on whatever investment he has put on ground over time. So there is really no better time to ask for what is justifiable to us. Um, the right time to have paid that salary was when it was due, mm -hmm. not when they were protesting. So they, I mean, they are not asking for anything, especially more so after you have done, you are done spending in December because the kids don't <laughs> care whether you are not paid. And as they always say, January <laughs> is a month of six weeks. You know, you know. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> first of all, I mean, uh, we, we've, it, it has turned over and over and we are just on the 10th or 11th of, of the month mm -hmm. and you have to pay these bills before the end of the month. The schools, are not um, interested in any stories. In fact, for some of those schools, the child had to come in with a teller at the gate mm -hmm. before you access the building. And so you come and say, I'm a parliamentary worker, they, they have uh, not paid salary. <laughs> 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 not paid salary. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, to think that uh, this kind of protest will be coming from a sensitive institution as that is, to say the least, very embarrassing mm. for the country. And, uh, you know, if you look at the, the implication of that you know, on their operation as parliamentarian, uh, parliamentary workers, you know, uh, it seemed to me like this has a potency to reduce these workers to beggars. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. There is nothing undignifying as having put in a shift and you don't get paid. It suggests you all kind of, if it is just merely begging to, to eat, it would have been nice. Imagine any of those workers' family come down with a health emergency. With our own kind of system, they probably don't even have a health insurance scheme. How do you even assess any kind of medical treatment? Uh, some arguments will be that they will be paid anyway. You will be paid when sometimes the emergency you would have avoided would have taken a hit on you. I mean, if you lose a loved one because you are unable to afford medical treatment of anywhere in the region of 2,000 or 10,000 Naira, even if you get paid a million Naira the day after, what difference does it make to you? So these implications are huge. And it's because we work in a system where nobody takes responsibility. There is nowhere we were told that finances were not available to the National Assembly. If these guys want to go to the Bahamas for all kind of retreat, finances are available, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I mean, we see them junketing everywhere in their numbers, either paying condolence visits to their own colleagues, loved ones, or showing up at the wedding of another colleague. And they do these things with the presidential jets, with private jets, they show in their glamour. I mean, if you show up there and you want to do a head count of the vehicles there and you put a value on the vehicle, they move with, the, with almost the budget of a state mm. on the road. Billions. Uh, you know, so why is it difficult to pay the, the salaries of people who aid your operation? You show up in the parliament and everything goes smoothly. People are behind those smooth operations and they need to be paid, mm. to say the least. All right. Well, uh, very interesting there. Uh, let's take a look at other stories. I know I'm, I'm going to give you the chance to comment on the big story of the yeah. day, which is about <laughs> the, the, the kingmaker wanting to be king. But mm. uh, that will be at the last lap you know, of our discussions. But uh, I want us to look at you know, other stories. Uh, we are seeing that the federal government is also lamenting about this cause um, not uh, paying you know, money. Uh, we're seeing indebtedness hits 326 billion naira uh, in nine months, according to federal government. So, uh, I mean, we've been talking about this power issue. So why are we seeing this high level of debt, you know, by the discourse? The government is the prime, um, would it be right to say suspects now, or the prime, uh, yeah, suspect if you like, culprit if you like in all of this. I mean, if, if you drill down, you this, these debts are accruing because of the inability of the discourse to recover debts from strategic locations, including government buildings, police barracks, army barracks, military formations, mm -hmm. the secretariat, they owe billions. And you know, there are places where it's it difficult to enforce 
collections, uh, not to even talk about even cutting, cutting electricity mm. supply to the, I mean, imagine you, you have to cut electricity supply to a military barracks. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were just reading how by not merely stopping traffic for mm. military officers to pass when it was in their time, they mm. came down heavily on the yellow fever person. Mm. I mean, you can imagine what it would mean if you tell a disco staff to approach a military barrack and cut off, <laughs> and cut off. <laughs> I mean, you have to send an ambulance after, after that stuff. So those kind of scenarios have aggravated uh, the situations. At some point, the government even have to, in a supplementary budget, provide for over a hundred billion to, yeah, you know, uh, to to reduce this indebtedness. So uh, we have to understand that the discos are a business, you know, um, and if you're offered service, you have to pay for it. Matter of fact, it, I think it is also because the metering system has not been as effective as it should be. Because with the metering system, you don't get power until you pay for it. So mm -hmm. it's prepaid, it's not postpaid. Uh, so what they are forced to do with most of these large buildings, uh, government formations, is to provide the power and then come up with an audit to tell how much they had consumed. And then you start chasing them over a period of time to, to have this money paid. So if we can effectively migrate completely to uh, the prepaid meters, mm. then it means the government agencies would have to make the money up, available up front, you know, to buy the number of units they need to be able to provide power to these government buildings, among other places where they've had difficulties trying to recover funding. So it's, it's a multifaceted problem. It has to do with the institutions. It has to do also, in some cases, with the inability or incapacity of, of the, the discourse themselves to to recover what is um, what is uh, a proper billion for most of the places where they provide power. Okay, uh, so now to the big story. Uh, could you just comment on the king maker wanting to be king? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? What a way to couch that that ambition. But I think it's been in the works for some time. We've seen all kinds of speculations. Um, the king maker at several times had said he's consulting. Uh, yesterday he told us he's being categorical and that um, he's going to come out. However, that the consultation continues, <laughs> uh, that he's going to make a formal declaration. I don't know how that formal declaration would, would differ from what we have seen yesterday. But I think it's to be expected. We have started seeing all kinds of political machination in the last couple of days. Uh, we have seen a group going around the country trying to sell the vice president as as the ideal candidate for the party. We've seen the president in his own uh, media uh, interaction saying he's not going to reveal his favorite because he fears that person may be killed. We are not sure if the favorite has revealed himself <laughs> or he's a different person from whom the president <laughs> wants us to believe, you know. But, but what, what that does to the Tinubu camp uh, is basically the impression that, okay, uh, since we are going to have more than a number of persons with interest in this, it's better to start early, you know, put out your ambitions in the open and start taking. Um, for others, they are not coming out because of the fear of burning out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, because these things involve funds. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of group waiting to show up at your doorstep the moment mm -hmm. you, you, know, you, you make these things open, mm -hmm. under all kinds of guys helping you, you know, whether it's neighbor to neighbor or <laughs> <laughs> whatever you choose to call them. So uh, people are being tactical about it. Timing is of the essence. Uh, and so perhaps his own camps have done some kind of um, calculations and think rather than continue to play behind the scene, uh, this is the best time to, to, to show off. I mean, and you see the other groups are also responding. Why is he making his uh, declaration that uh, the best candidate would be a different person? So it's an interesting time for us. Mm -hmm. uh, now the cat has been let out in the open. Mm -hmm. uh, and so every movement they make now, we would have the right to, to make all kinds of um, insinuation about those movements because we know what those movements are get. I get it was. Um, but if you ask my private opinion, um, like the Tinibus, I would want to see the youth also gear up. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to go to the president to announce your intention. You can announce it to us in the social media platform. I mean, there are quite a number of followings in those places. People who are very serious, who, have, who are confident about themselves and have a good idea of how and where this country should be moving to. Mm -hmm. Should be coming up, you know, to match 
uh, these Octo Nigerians and, uh, uh, and the rest of them uh, who seem to have perpetually been in the corridor of, of power. So that perhaps this is the best time, one year to the election, to begin to weigh the options that we have mm -hmm. and to begin to listen to these persons, to, to begin to you know, take interest in this person and follow what they are saying, you know, uh, and, and as, as the election approaches to then settle for what we think is the best option for this guy. I don't have a problem with uh, Tinibu as a person. I just think that we have played around a certain age band for too long. Mm. Perhaps we need to mm -hmm. try something a bit younger and more um, energetic and why our kingmakers, perhaps remain kingmakers, mm. uh, you know, so that they can guide people to move forward. But that's my private private perspective, uh, um, and as a person, I also wish to live well with his ambition. Mm. You know, we've always talked about, you know, this youth involvement and participation, and a lot of experts have said, look, uh, the ANSARS protest was like a lead mustache, you know, that demonstrated the power and the influence of the youth on Nigeria's direction in terms of democracy and politics and all of that. Are we seeing as much, you know, engagement by young people in terms of, say, for now, what, they should, what we should be seeing more in terms of voter registration, you know, campaigns on social media as to, you know, what to look out for in 2023 and all of that? It doesn't seem like anything like that is going on. No, absolutely. Nothing of such is going on. I think the youth, after a period of time, maybe as a result of a prolonged military rule or... Perhaps we have been conditioned to think that you have to attain a certain age, mm -hmm. you know, to, to begin to even think of leading this country. So somehow as a collective, uh, the youth in this country have not fully attuned their minds to the reality that they have attained, I mean, governance should be about them for, for the country. They have the energy, they have the education, you know, they have the capacity, they have the numbers. Uh, if you put the total voting population of, let's look at the last election, 15 million for the president, another 10 million for, for the PDP president. That's just about 25 million. And we are talking about an active youth population of about 70 million. So you can even ignore the entire population that voted in the last election and converse a new set of people that can change the narrative uh, that is, if, for, for instance, you, we imagine that the, la the, the current people would not even do anything for you. So the space is huge. It can be explored for others. We have the benefit of social media. You don't have to show up in any town hall. Of course, you have to do that, but you don't necessarily have to show up everywhere to be able to reach um, a lot of persons. So it, we need that reconditioning. And if we look at the numbers clearly, they do not exactly conform with some of the fears we have. I mean, Bashir Tofa of blessed memory contested for the president if he died at 72, 73, and he contested sometimes in 1993. If you net that off, he contested in his 40s. Hmm. You know, and, and we have a number of, how old was Gowan when, when the responsibility of leading a nation fall on his shoulders? How old was this president when he had his first shot at the, at the presidency in 1983? If you net that time off, which is nearly 40 years, uh, about 37 years from his current age, you'll be talking about him, you know, around that age where most of us seem to want to be comfortable with the age of a president, you know, because of the exigency of those office. So it's something we need to start interrogating. People need to take responsibility. The entire private sector in this country is driven by the youth. How old is, for instance, the MD and CEO of, 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 of um, Access Bank? How old is the guy in, the G, in JITCO? How old is the person in First Bank? And these are huge institutions with a lot of uh, uh, complexities being run by youth and several other uh, private sector players. You can begin to look at that. If they could do it at that level, what is so special about playing uh, I mean, vying for governorship or even the Senate or in the national, rather than have these men who have given their best in the past show up in the Senate and they sleep half of the time and the other half. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm really curious again, could it be, you know, because of the cost of governance, that is why, you know, the youths are reluctant to I agree with the cost, especially judging from what it is, but mm -hmm. that is why we have all of the options. How much do you need to be talking to people on social media rather than the way it is. Uh, what I'm saying is we may not succeed at the first try, but we can try to change how 
these things work, such that the emphasis does not become largely about money, but about people who can engage, uh, you know, with, with, with their followers and what alternative you are bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And like other proper economies, this is a, that is why we need some kind of reforms with the electoral system that de-emphasizes cost largely and creates room for competition. You know, at some point in this country, we talked about independent candidature. We don't know how far it will go when it comes to the presidency, but that is a serious game changer for elections, say, at the council, local government council level or chairmanship or even a state where people, by their previous activities, have garnered a lot of interest and following. Mm -hmm. You can then begin to rely, because if you want to depend on the structure as we have it today, it will be difficult for anybody to walk through the roads because the structure are controlled by all kinds of sets and what they, they, they consider as criteria for putting out a candidate is completely different from the ideals that you and I subscribe to. Mm. Now, you know, if you look at, you know, as lessons, you know, from the NSAS as well, one of the things that many people pointed to is the level of coordination you know, that was seen in that protest. It's unlike it. It's, it's, I don't think we've ever seen that kind of level of coordination. You have, you know, them providing security for themselves, providing... Finance. Em yes, you know, emergency situations, uh, ambulances and the likes, uh, you know, water, food and all that. Uh, and, you know, in some instances, you don't find them picking debt from wherever they, you know, go to and all of that. And people are saying, well, th that's coordination. That shows a group of people that can actually organize themselves. So how is it so difficult to apply that, you know, to, you know, political campaigns and, and all that? <laughs> there are quite a number of um, things to my mind. Um, we have not been able to find a rallying point. We don't exactly agree on the same thing. It was easy with the NSAS thing, especially around the Southwest, because everybody agreed at the time that the police was a problem. Mm. And you know, it was like coming together, set our differences aside to fight a common enemy. We do not share the same aspiration when it comes to politics and religion in this country. We, we are so polarized and pursue different values that it becomes, mobilization becomes essentially difficult. We have not been able to sufficient, even when everybody suffers the consequence of bad governance, we have not been able to agree on what we should value and what, what we should cherish and uphold versus what we should not. So uh, as far as we are concerned at national level, the conversation around politics is still largely immersed in where is the candidate coming from. If he's coming from my part of the country, then he will do no wrong. Mm. Where is the president from if it's from my part of the country then whatever he does is is the best i in mean in fact that, that conversation isn't it elitist kind of a conversation and you know if you say it down on, on uh, followership well is it really elitist it's about then <laughs> the the painful aspect of it really is that it begins to also question the quality of our youth category mm. on how especially to divorce themselves from the prejudices of the past. If there is no power, it wouldn't matter where you come from in this country. It impacts your entire being from having a decent, I mean, it's going to get hot very soon, you, except you have extra cash to, to maintain a generator and run it for nearly 24 hours. You are going to suffer from the consequences of not having power. If you run a business, it impacts on your business. You know, uh, if you can't afford good food, it impacts on, on, I mean, you begin to struggle with stunted growth with your children. It wouldn't matter who is president. If you show up in the market, nobody says wh where it's your local government or catchment area to know <laughs> where, how much we are going to price the beans you want to buy and all of that. So there is, there is, we share in the consequence of bad governance. How that becomes, how we are not able to translate that anger, that dissatisfaction into some kind of consensus to begin to ask for certain qualities and criteria from people who aspire to leadership is what beats me as a youth. Uh, but when we show up in private institutions that are run by young people, they set rules, we all abide by it. We kind of direct our energies in one direction to, to get goals. But migrating that energy, that collective aspiration into a public space has been difficult. Um, how we are going to break that is what's, what I don't understand, but I think it's something that really needs to happen and very fast. Mm. All right. Well, 
Thank you so much. Uh, we have to end the discussion here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very, very interesting uh, perspectives uh, there. We've been speaking with Sunday Michael, Deputy Business Editor, Daily Trust uh, Newspaper. Now, we'll be going into another uh, segment of the show, you know, discussing other uh, issues, not far away from, you know, what we've been touching on uh, with a different guest. Let's take this break. Please stay with us. When the situation where you find that they must look at the situation. It's not necessarily uh, tribal or regional. The board and management of Media Trust Limited invites the general public to its annual daily trust dialogue themed 2023, The Politics, Economy and Insecurity. Date, 20th January 2022. Location, NAF Conference Center and Suites, Abuja. Time, 10 a.m. prompt. Chairman of the occasion, former head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, GCFR. Guest speaker, Governor of Kaduna State, Malan Nasr Ahmed El Rufai. Guest speaker, Governor of Ibonyi State, Engineer David Umahi. Guest speaker, former chairman, Federal Inland Revenue Service, Mrs. Ifueko Omoigui Okauru. Moderator, Executive Director, Daria Media Nigeria Limited, Kaderia Ahmed. The event will be transmitted live on Trust TV, and all participants must observe COVID-19 protocols and wear their face masks.
all eyes are now on the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, which came to power with the change mantra, apparently to bring change to the art of governance and reintroduce internal party democracy lacking in the existing political parties. But seven years down the lane, the APC, which is the coming together of AMPP, CPC, ACN and factions of APGA and PDP struggles to position itself to consolidate its hold and to power. There may be some shortcomings, but there are several areas where the APC government has made giant strides. There's no doubt about those things, and those things will come into play when election starts. At statewide congresses were characterized by parallel exercise and B cuttings at least in 12 out of the 36 states of the Federation. This is compounded by the legitimacy crisis suffered by its extraordinary caretaker and convention committee amidst uncertainty for the much anticipated national convention scheduled for February. The atmosphere currently at the National Secretariat of the APC, located in Wusetu, is that of uncertainty. Uh, just as uh, President Muhammad Buhari and the governors of the party are currently meeting uh, to find solutions you know, to the crisis rocking the party, uh, which is uh, very pregnant for the fact that uh, no one has a clear indication as to what the resolutions will be. So also, the party's reconciliatory move, headed by the former governor of Nasrallah State, Senator Abdullahi Adamu, is also ongoing. Uh, the team is visiting some APC trouble states uh, to meet with the warring factions and uh, reconcile them ahead of the scheduled convention of the party in February. Some top party chieftains, mostly former governors Alimadi Sharif, Tanko Almakura, George Akume, Abdelaziz Yari, amongst others, want to slog it out in a hot race for the top party job, the national chairman position. APC right now uh, is at a stage that requires a very firm, very strong, very knowledgeable, very wise and very smart leadership. Uh, given the, what has happened in the last uh, year, uh, since the Ashamole NWC left, uh, the interim committee have done a good job, thank God for them, but, but going into 2023, the party needs a well-structured constitutionally recognized leadership. As forces within the party struggle to have an edge by influencing the timeline for the convention largely expected to produce consensus candidates, the concerns, however, is can the party effectively handle the challenge in addition to deciding where its presidential ticket will go? Shapiro Suleiman, Trust TV News, Abuja. Well, there you have it, you know, quite a lot uh, really going on. Uh, the internal crisis in the APC and the conversation about the party convention coming up uh, later in the year uh, is getting louder and more so the 2023 presidential uh, election. Now, let's take a look at our next uh, discussion. Okay, now the national leader of the All Progressive Congress, uh, Asiwa Jibola Tinubu, on Monday declared that he had informed President Muhammad Buhari of his presidential ambition. Asiwa Tinubu disclosed this while addressing State House correspondence after a closed door meeting with Buhari in his office at the presidential villa in Abuja. The APC stalwart, however, said he was yet to publicly disclose his, his ambition as he was still in consultations with various interests across the country. But finally, we have seen him actually declare his presidential bid. Now we have Daily Trust political editor Muda Shir here in the studio to give us perspectives on this new pronouncement. Welcome to the program. Good morning. All right. Okay, so we have a clip uh, from that declaration. Uh, we'll take a look at that before we begin uh, the discussion proper. Take a look. The president of my intention, but I've not informed the Nigerians yet. I'm still consulting. And uh, I have no problem consulting 
and have not set a parameter of uh, limitation to the extent of uh, how many people will I con consult, you will soon hear, all you want to hear is a categorical declaration. You've gotten that truth from me that I've informed the pre uh, Mr. President of my ambition. He is a Democrat. He didn't ask me to stop. He didn't ask me not to attempt and pursue my ambition. It's a lifelong ambition. Well, there you have it. The kingmaker who wants to be king. And now we have the political editor in the, in the studio uh, to talk to us about this kingmaker. Who exactly are we talking about? Who is Tinubu? Aswaji Bola Ahmed Tinubu is 69. It, he, he was governor of Lagos State between 1999 and 2007. Before then, he was uh, elected uh, to represent uh, Lagos uh, East or West in 92. He has been in politics in the last uh, in the last 30 years, and he has been controlling the political machinery of Lagos State since 1999. He played key role in the emergence of uh, the, uh, his successors, one Raji Fashola. Uh, Ambody, Ankumi Ambody, and now the present governor, Sanwolu. And if you recall, in 2014, 2013, 2014, he played a critical role in the emergence of this uh, administration. You know, the president tried thrice, I mean, President Mohamed Dubari, until when they came together and formed alliance with the ACN uh, before he got it in 2015. Mm. So, 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 why the kingmaker wanting to become king suddenly? While responding to questions from state out reporters yesterday, he said that it has been his lifelong ambition to become the president of the country. And you see that uh, you, uh, that that's his own uh, right. He has the right to contest and to aspire for the presidency as a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Now, wh why is it so important to visit the president? You know, uh, I mean, yes, you said he played a critical role in the emergence of the president, you know, becoming you know, the president of Nigeria uh, today. But again, this is a president who said, well, he actually doesn't care who succeeds him, you know, in 2023. <laughs> I, so why are you even, <laughs> you know, going to meet him and all of that? You know, his visit came days after the president uh, in an interview with Channel TV that uh, mm. he doesn't care who succeeds him. Mm. And there have been reports that uh, uh, some Chieftains of PDP, including the section of the president, are uh, win the former president, the person of good luck, Jonathan, to contest for the presidency. I think uh, as Raji Tinubu went to the villa just to remind the president that uh, come, I played key role in the emergence in 2014-2015. Now it's the payback it's time. Payback time isn't it? oh. It's time to reward me back. You know, okay. this has been my ambition to, to become the president, okay. to come and support me. Mm. Okay. It's just to get the president to key into his presidential And this is also ambition. coming almost, like, uh, one may say, at the eve of the proposed APC convention, which still remains, you know, a controversy and all of that. But again, look at the timing. Is this going to have any implication, you know, on the planning for the convention of the APC? Uh, yes, it will. You know, the delay in the conduct of the convention, some will tell you it's because of this political on who fly the party's tickets. Mm. Because, you know, whoever emerges as the national chairman will determine where the presidential ticket goes to. Mm. And the key issue in the party as it is now is zoning. Mm. The convention is being delayed because of zoning. People are afraid that as soon as uh, the national chairmanship position is zoned to a section of the country, definitely others will say, OK, this position is going to the south. Definitely this one should go to the north. Or this position is going to the north, definitely the other position should go to the south. Okay. Now, uh, Asiwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu made a statement saying he had, President Buhari had already known his ambition to become, you know, to, to uh, become president, to contest, you know, for the presidency. Uh, but President Buhari said he actually doesn't care about who becomes um, the president. Do you think uh, President Buhari had already known prior to? this pronouncement of being, uh, you know, 
uh, contesting for the presidential seat. If you recall in 2014, shortly before the 2015 general election, the Tinubu was in the race for the, he wanted to become the running mate to the president. So President Buhari, I think President Buhari is fully aware of the ambition of uh, Asiwaji Bola and Tinubu. Okay. All right. Well, now let's talk about the, you know, the fractions, or I would say the groupings in the APC ahead of this uh, 2023 uh, presidential election. Quite a number of people are, at least even if they have not formally indicated interest, we've heard speculation, you know, about quite a number of them. Uh, we've seen that the vice president himself has a group, a campaign group, uh, even though <laughs> groups. groups as a matter of fact, even though they will all say that, uh, well, the vice president uh, is not aware of what they are doing, uh, you know, but we know that <coughs> that's all politics. Uh, you have also other groups, uh, you know, coming out. And then if you look at also the other party, the PDP, you know, the caliber of people that, you know, they are all churning out. Uh, you think, do you think that at the end of the day, uh, these parties will be able to reach a kind of a consensus without really uh, breaking their backs in the sense of uh, seeing some kind of disintegration, defection, you know, of members? You know, already a lot of people are expressing fear that uh, the party may explode at the end of the day because the tendencies, the groups that came together to form the party are all out mm -hmm. to grab the structure ahead of 2023 politics. You know, the president is from the CPC, mm -hmm camp and other the four other camps are all out and saying that this is our own time to get to get it. Mm. So there is possibility if they are unable to manage the tendencies mm. in the party very well, the party may go and explode because everybody is out just to grab the soul of the party for its own selfish or maybe its own political ambition. Okay, now still talking about zoning, the Ohanesis are saying it's Igbo stone that um, Tinubu's, you know, declaration of the presidential, becoming the president, um, upholding the presidential seat is um, some way selfish. Do you think this is going to be a problem? It will not be a problem. At the end of the day, they may go to the primaries. Everybody will contest. Tinubu may contest. Even though Simbajo may contest against his uh, former boss in the person of Tinubu. So the Alneze, the Igbos in, mm. the, in the ruling party, APC, they too, they will contest if they are interested. It's a game of number. If you go to the primary, if you are able to, I don't know whether, if, whether the direct, they will use direct or indirect primary. You know, mm. this thing is still before it's the still, National mm -hmm. Assembly. So wh whichever they are using, you, it's a game of number. Mm. Mm. All right, now let, let's talk about this convention. We are seeing that APC governors are split over the convention date. Uh, maybe you should talk to us about that and uh, the implication of that on the whole politics in the APC. You know, the APC governors, we have two camps. There are some that are saying, no, let us have this convention. We have so that we can have an NWC, that's National Working Committee, to lead us to the 2023 election. Mm -hmm. There are some that are afraid, they are saying, no, let us delay this thing. Because as soon as we have an NWC, the politicking may take a very dangerous uh, shape. Mm. So let us delay this thing and delay, delay, delay until maybe it will be late for those people that may be aggrieved to leave the party. Mm -hmm. Definitely at the end of the convention, mm -hmm. there, there will be some people that will be aggrieved that will not be satisfied with uh, those people that will, may emerge as uh, the NWC, the national chairman and other NWC positions. So it's a deliberate It's debate. a deliberate, it's a game. You know, generally speaking, politics is a game. You know how to manipulate things to favor you and uh, maybe favor the party. It all depends on where you are standing. Okay, so with Tinubu's new declaration, how do you think Nigerian youth, you know, will actually take this? If you look at the corridor of power, you have very few youths in it. Even aside, even all other aspirants, all other people that are aspiring for the presidency, if you look then, they are in their 60s, Tinubu is 69, if you look at Atiku, he's 70 or maybe 69. Most of them are all old person, people. So it, is, it will be very difficult for, we, for us to have a young person becoming our president. I don't know, maybe, maybe in 10, 20 years to come, but for 2023, 
definitely it will be around, it will be, we are going to get our president from among these people that you see around now. Mm. You know, you sound really, it sounds really hopeless. <laughs> are, are we really that hopeless? No, no, are no. Are the youths really do not have No, no, it will take time. But if you see gradually, we are seeing special advisors that are very young. Before you know, you see chairman, chairman that are young, you see governors that are young. In 99, you have people that became governor at 30 something. The donor Duke and what have you. Mm -hmm. Uh, of Kogi, governor Yabel of Kogi became governor at uh, less than 40. So what changed? What and you see, me, I would like to advise we youths that uh, we should, you know, we have the not too young to rule for them. We should use it to aspire to, uh, and achieve our aim. Mm. But, uh, I mean, as if you, isn't it just, uh, isn't it more than, you know, about the age in terms of Yes, we have the law that says, yes, not too young to run, but you also uh, alluded to the fact that when you come to financing, it's a major issue, you know, which in most cases will not, you know, uh, allow you to be able to participate fully. But, well, we'll keep the conversation going. Well, thank you so much for coming uh, on the show. This and uh, let me quickly say this. Mm. In days to come, you will see other aspirants going to the president. There, there is that likelihood to tell him that me too, I'm, I'm aspiring to succeed you in 2020, just the way Tinubu did. And people are still looking up to Osimbajo, vice president, whether he's going to contest against his uh, former boss in court or maybe we we'll just let it go. But there are a lot of groups campaigning for him. Only yesterday, 57 groups endorsed his uh, candidature. Mm. So we see, we are watching to see how this will go. Mm. So Tinubu cleared the pathway for others. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. And, um, you know, we'll look forward to have you again on the show. Thank you. All right. Thank We've you. been speaking with uh, Ismail Modashir. He is a, a political editor, Daily Trust uh, newspaper. Let's take a quick breather now. And then when we come back, we'll take a look at other discussions on the program. Please stay with us. to welcome back if you are just joining us this is daybreak on trust television now let's take a look at another dimension you know on the program 
The Central Bank of Nigeria has stated that excessive borrowing by the federal government from the CBN's means and ways advances window could frustrate CBN's monetary policy. The Apex Bank said when the federal government exceeds its revenue, the CBN finance government deficit through ways and means advances subject to the limits set in the existing regulations, which are sometimes disregarded by the federal government. As of the first quarter of 2015, the country's public debt stood at 12.06 trillion naira, a figure that has ballooned to 38 trillion naira as of last September, recording um, a growth of 208%. Still, the official statistics under report the actual amount owed. Now, last year, the Fitch Ratings, a global research institution, raised the alarm that the government reliance on ways and means facility facilitates sourced from the Central Bank of Nigeria to fund budget shortfalls to finance a deficit was a major cause of the country's rising inflation. Now, to give us perspectives on this particular topic, we have an economics, uh, Dr. Samson Galadima here in the studio with us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank yeah. you for having me. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, well, let's get a sense of what's going on here. Um, the nexus between this, you know, excessive borrowings that the central bank is complaining and, you know, this, this uh, issue of monetary policy, how does that, you know, have an implication on it? Uh, all right. Um, I think it was the central bank governor, Emefele, that said it would be irresponsible of the central bank not to finance the government should the need arise. And nobody is saying the central bank should not finance the government. Mm. But there are laid down rules they have to follow. The CBN Act 2007 says, uh, Section 38 to be precise, says if the government has liquidity issues, if it has a shortfall in revenue, the central bank can come to the rescue. But the same law says the help, the financing that the central bank can render to the government must not exceed 5% of previous year's revenue at any particular time. And all the borrowings that um, the government gets from the central bank must be paid back within the financial year. That if it is not paid back, that power by the central bank to lend to the government cannot be exercisable. That's exactly how it is being put in the act establishing the central bank as amended in 2007. But the central bank has not been doing that. They have been lending, I think in 2020, they lend as high as 80% of 2019's revenue. And they have been abusing that and over has it, the years. has that been paid back by the federal it, it has not been paid back. In fact, it was not even transparent initially. They, they, they were doing it as if they didn't want anybody to know initially until it was too obvious for them to hide. Mm. So the, it has been accumulating. And in the, on, on the website of the central bank, you have it st clearly stated that uh, the government can undermine monetary policy when the government uh, asks the central bank or the monetary authority to lend it money beyond what is stipulated by law. Mm -hmm. That is indirectly undermining the ability of the monetary authority to perform its functions. And this thing has been happening. And they have been using COVID as an excuse. But even before COVID, that has been the case. It's not a new thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now according to research, this has also been responsible for the country's rising inflation. Could you just walk us through how this actually affects us directly as, a, as an economy? All right. Um, according to arguably the greatest monetary economist, Milton Friedman, that inflation always and everywhere is a monetary phenomenon. Mm. In the sense that it is produced early, it can be produced early by more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. When you just print money, when the uh, printing press in the central bank is in, overdrive, is in overdrive, yes. You just print money, you give it to the government without increase in production. That is cutting inflation. Unless if the, the only way that um, you, you are going to print money and it's not going to be inflationary is when output 
increases by the same ratio, by the same amount, mm -hmm. or even higher. But as long as you're just printing money and giving it to the government to pay salaries to do things, that's definitely inflationary. And it's not only going to affect inflation, even the value of your currency will be affected. The exchange rate will be affected. Uh, macroeconomic stability will be caused because of that. So the problems are, are just not too, too good. Mm -hmm. All right, now, uh, when you place that side by side by the advisory of the IMF, you know, for Nigeria to devalue, you know, its currency further and also raise the interest rate, uh, this morning we're seeing that story on our front pages. Uh, what would you, how would you react to this advisory? Do you think that it's in the best interest of Nigeria, uh, you know, putting that side by side with this issue? All right, our currency, to be honest, is artificially, the value is artificially maintained. Um, if you allowed market forces to determine the true value of the currency, that's when you know what the currency is actually worth. But at, at the moment, the central bank intervenes um, and is basically packed. It's packed, but even uh, for the parallel market that may not be packed, the central bank intervenes from time to time. So it's basically a packed currency, officially, formally. Then um, uh, on the parallel market, it may not be that, but it is managed fluid, what we call dirty fluid. That means if it reaches, if the value of the currency reaches a level that the monetary authority is not comfortable with, the monetary authority intervenes. So it's basically controlled. And um, the best thing, if we want, because Nigerians are not happy, when the value of the Naira goes down. And it's not, you don't blame them because for practical reasons, we are basically an import dependent economy. So when the value of our currency goes down, whether officially, if the central bank officially devalues the currency or through market forces on the parallel market, we all suffer for it. Whatever we are buying, the prices go up, whether it's uh, machinery or um, ICT devices, whatever. We are basically dependent. So prices go up and all of us suffer. And even things that are not imported because of the ripple effect of that, it's, um, the, the, the fall in the value affects virtually everything within the economy. So the, the main reason is because we hardly export anything and we import virtually everything that we need. So the best way to, uh, the best approach is to find a way to export. We have to be, an export-led economy, and if for things that we cannot export, we, we have to substitute it, and um, it has to be done in an efficient way. I know the current government is trying to do that with agriculture, but what is our comparative advantage with agriculture? The, the government is fixated on agriculture. I'm not saying there's anything bad with trying to make us uh, attain food sufficiency is a good thing, but you have to strike a balance and you have to look at your comparative advantage. What are you good at? What can you produce in an efficient way without so much money put into, and then the output is not commensurate to what you have put in? And the Nigerians are talented. We can offer a lot of services. We, yeah. we, are, we have highly skilled people, we have doctors, we have engineers, we have lawyers, we have so many people that can hardly uh, find jobs. Our unemployment is very high. Why can't we um, exploit all these things to see how we can generate? If oil is our major source of um, foreign exchange earning, can't we work on um, remittances? Uh, thank God for COVID. I know COVID has, has a lot of downsides, mm -hmm. but it also has upsides. So the world is, you can work remotely now. Nigerians can work from here mm -hmm. and they'll be earning hard currency. That can actually help the value of the currency. That can also help with inflation and so many other things. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things can be done where there is a will, but um, sadly I think the will is not there um, for now. And we have been paying lip service to diversification. Our economy in terms of GDP is highly diversified. Mm -hmm. Oil makes up less than 10% of our GDP. But where the issue is, is when you're talking about foreign exchange earning and revenue. That's what we need to work on. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a lot of work to do. Okay. Now, from your explanation, it seems like we've actually abused um, the ways and means, you know, financing um, uh, policy and all of that. Um, what other options are open for us? All right. Um, the, the government, we have been running basically a deficit budget for a while now. 
and um, it's not a crime to have a deficit budget, but it should only be done when it's necessary. And when you're borrowing, because the deficits are the ones that accumulate over time for you to have a huge national debt. So if you're going to borrow, preferably borrow for um, things that can actually pay for themselves down the line. If I'm borrowing, let's say, to build a railway, for example, um, from Abuja to Kaduna, the build a rail line from Abuja to Kaduna, how will that pay for itself? Uh, I think um, Nigerians are happy when uh, things are convenient, things are smooth, true. Everybody wants that, and we want to live, we want to make our country to be as livable as possible. But we have to consider the costs, either now or down the line. Um, I saw a study that said uh, building red, red lines for uh, conveying passengers may not actually make economic sense because that can hardly pay for itself. That the best way to, uh, to go about it is to build rail lines for freight, for maybe conveying goods around the country. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to look at all these things. If we feel um, that is not economically viable for the country, we can allow private individuals to do that. I know um, it may, they may find it difficult. Maybe we can do PPP with private individuals and they look at how to make the most of it. But just building something, building roots because you feel like it or you feel it's capital, and at the end of the day, you cannot pay for, you cannot service your debt, and this keeps ballooning mm. down the line. You have a dead um, trap. So we have to strike a balance. Mm -hmm. And also, domestic borrowings, the interest, the rate of interest may be high, but um, they do less damage to the Nera. But if you borrow externally, uh, and then you devalue your currency, like I remember when the, the official exchange rate was around 305, 307, and then the central bank um, devalued to around 379. It's not uh, the debt just ballooned by more than trillion, mm -hmm. just because of the devaluation. Mm -hmm. So that is the cost we have to pay. The rate of interest externally may be lower than what we have domestically. But we have to look at other factors. It's not just the rate of interest that matters. Other things are also equally important. OK. Mm -hmm. Now, where, we should, where should we be also looking at in terms of showing up revenue for government? Uh, if you look at the 2022 budget now, for instance, and the finance bill uh, put forward, uh, which I believe is, is, is signed now. Yeah, it's signed. It's an act you know, now. Uh, uh, if you look at the finance bill now, uh, are there opportunities you know, that could see us sharing more revenue for the government now instead of these you know, borrowings, you know, such that we can reduce the extent to which we, we actually borrow? All right. I, I think um, we have been saying it. I, I hope that... Um, what we are proposing, what the government is proposing, is practicable. The, uh, our revenue, our tax revenue to GDP is one of the lowest in the world, not only in Africa. Even compared to our peers in Africa, we are not teen wiki. We are in the region of 7%. That's what we generate as tax revenue compared to GDP, 7%. Right? Other countries in Africa, even in Africa, generate as high as 18%. So, uh, and the government has been looking at that, and they're trying to see if they can actually increase the revenue we generate. They are targeting 15% by 2025, and that's why they want to increase, uh, they want to increase taxes. Uh, uh, the Finance Act said they are going to tax uh, sugary drinks, carbonated drinks, right? Um, even um, uh, digital companies that may not have physical presence here, but the activities, uh, a company like Facebook, it may not have an office in Nigeria, or let me use Twitter, the obvious one. Twitter does not have an office in Nigeria, but we know Nigerians tweet. Millions of Nigerians are on Twitter, people advertise, people make money on Twitter, so they want to tax that. And even uh, big um, uh, companies that are involved in online trading like um, Amazon, Alipay, Alibaba rather, uh, the government wants to see if they can work with those people so that they can remit VAT to them, right? Mm -hmm. So these are ways that the government is um, trying to see, uh, even gaming, uh, bet, the betting that Nigerians are involved in. 
all these things, the government is trying to find a way to, to tax them. And I think there is nothing bad with trying to tax, but even the taxation has to be done with, um, uh, you have to look at the economics of it. You don't tax an industry into dying. Exactly. So Just like we are seeing in Kano now, we are seeing that uh, the <laughs> Keke uh, tricycle riders, uh, popularly known as Keke, are on strike. And that's having a devastating implication already if you look at the losses that were recorded in just one day about 300 uh, million naira was said to have been lost you know as a result of that but we'll talk more uh, on that uh, shortly after this breather please stay with us Welcome back. If you are just joining us, you're still watching Daybreak on Trust Television. And uh, we have an economist here giving us perspectives uh, on some of the issues, some of the burning issues, uh, you know, in our economy. So uh, before we went on the break, we we're actually giving us uh, some perspectives on some of these issues. Could, could you walk us through uh, the issue of taxation in Nigeria? All right. Um uh, it's a common belief in Nigeria that um, we are not taxed at all because and the, the numbers are there, the data is there. Our tax revenue to GDP is one of the lowest in the world. So um, government needs to do something about it and we too as citizens, we need to cooperate with the government so that we pay our taxes. But of course, when you pay your taxes, you want to see results. So it's not just about paying taxes. I believe that Nigerians are patriotic enough to pay their taxes. But they want to see results. They want to see roots. They want to see uh, pipe and water. They want to see other infrastructure. They want to see the economy, uh, uh, their cities or their towns become more livable. All these things are important. And we, the, the, the issue is um, some of us tend to live in denial because we don't want taxes and um, government borrows money 
or it uh, compels the central bank to print money, and that causes inflation. That causes the Naira to get devalued, and then our standard of living get, becomes so. Lower. One way or another, <laughs> one way or another, we get to pay for it. Yeah, either way, we have to pay for either it, yes. directly or indirectly. Indirectly, yes. So, 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 so you think that you know this inflation that we are you know experiencing is a direct uh, consequence, you know, of you know this shortage in uh, revenue, you know, by government. And yes, all that. it is. And um, it was Milton Friedman that said, um, tag, uh, inflation is taxation without representation. If a government wants to increase um, taxes, for example, it's going to tell you that, all right, we're going to use the money to do this and that. But when, the, when there is inflation, and then maybe, let's say, uh, inflation is at 20%, and um, what you have, uh, your purchasing power gets um, diminished, right? Nobody tells you, what that uh, loss that you have experienced is being used for. So um, Nigerians have to accept that um, we have to pay taxes. And the government said, I remember, I think it should be Finance Act 2019, that the government said we shift away from direct taxes to indirect taxes, like VAT now, where you buy things and you tax. I think that one is, is, is better because it's not directly uh, taken away from your income. Is indirectly done, so it's not as noticeable. It, it, I'm not saying it's not as um, costly, but it's indirect because if I buy newspaper and um, the the tax is inherent in what I pay for, mm. it's not that noticeable. But let's say my salary is um, hundred thousand, and the government takes twenty thousand, is too obvious. And it, I, some people take it personal. I'm from Gombe State, and I remember the government. Uh, imposing some taxes and asking people to pay for health insurance and the people are bitter they are livid about it but if you uh, if it's inflation people just growing but they will hardly because it's not directly the hundred thousand is still coming mm -hmm. it's just that uh, if they could uh, buy something for one thousand before now they have to pay two one thousand maybe five or one thousand two mm -hmm. but are nigerians really aware of this you know form of withdrawing tax indirectly Ah, I think majority of Nigerians may not know. Mm. Majority may not know because um, even the educated ones, they may not be so keen about such things. So it takes somebody that is knowledgeable, it takes enlightenment for people to realize uh, the price they are paying for certain behavior and that uh, it's better sometimes that you pay taxes and you demand accountability. Uh, there is no, nothing wrong. Uh, there are some countries that tax um, 40%, the tax 30%, right? But you as a citizen, you have to demand accountability. You have to ask them, all right, I've, I've been giving you this amount of money, I cannot see it. Mm. You have to ask and so, find out how the money is so being used. So in, in terms of doing that, how can government go about doing that in a, an economy like ours that is largely informal? You know, uh, how do you go ahead taxing people? Yes, that, that's actually a weakness. We need to make businesses easily register. Um, Nigeria is one of the harshest places to do business. And maybe that's why, according to, not, my, not by me, according to the World Bank, ease of doing business. Yeah. I remember the vice president and his, as well as his committee has been trying to help improve Nigeria's ease of doing business. But let's be honest, it's just cosmetics that they have been doing so far. Mm. They are not, we are not ready to do the right things. If we make uh, the business environment really friendly, and you know that if you're not registered, you not get those benefits, everybody will try to register. Mm. And you make it very seamless to do that. But when you know that informally pays, so why should I register? Well, 65% of Nigeria's economy is informal, 65%. So the, the larger chunk of the economy is informal, and you can hardly tax an informal economy. The best thing is to make it very easy for people to register. If you can, if possible, make it almost free. Look at what the telcos um, did. When they came, how much was SIM? But they realized that by having the price of SIM really high, it was a deterrent. It, it stopped people from acquiring uh, lines. And they said, all right, it's better if we make it almost free and then you, we, we will make up for that by people recharging their phones. And it has actually been better. So I think we need to think along the same line. I registered a business some four or five years ago, and it cost me 
a tiny fraction. I, uh, recently, I registered another one. It's almost twice what it cost me three, four years ago. It shouldn't be. It should be very easy for everything to I mean, be done. Aside registering, <laughs> uh, you know, aside registering business, uh, there are other factors, of course, uh, of isn't course. it, that, yes. you know, that helps you know, businesses run and all of that. Yes. Uh, for instance, the issue of electricity you know, has been uh, a long, an age-long issue that we've been talking about in Nigeria. Uh, just this morning, we are seeing on the front pages also how these calls are owing federal government you know, in the billions, you know, and all of that. And our, our analyst earlier on said that, look, at the end of the day, if you check it, mostly, most of the people that owe that money uh, for the discos are government institutions, you know, and all of that. So uh, how do we reconcile all of this? You know, um, I'm, I'm not really proud to say this. Um, it's, it's, it's sad, but I, I think it's, um, it's factual. Nigeria is not a law and other country. I'm sorry to say this, but we are not people that are very strict about rule of law. And it's not just the citizens, even the government. We know how things are done. Mm -hmm. We don't adhere strictly to laws. So that has proven our undoing. And it has to start somewhere. Um, it was Chino Achebe that said, uh, Nigeria's problem is 100% leadership. I think it's 1,000% leadership. If you have a leader that leads by example, he followed laid down rules and does not for any reason allow any law or any rule to be flouted for his own personal interest or aggrandizement, I think that will go a long way. Some would say that we have that leader in the president, you know, <laughs> being a president okay. who frowns, yeah, who frowns at corruption uh, and all of that. But apparently it becoming, it's becoming like it's beyond just the passing at the helm of affairs in the sense that, you know, attitudinally there are other things that need to be done, you know, by Nigerians to actually key into whatever vision, you know, the, the leaders will have. Anyway, it's just... It's just mm, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I, I know uh, the, the president has been uh, hyped even before he became president, but I think, uh, I'm sorry to say it's more of hype than reality because our situation has not changed. And as a leader, I know you're only one person. Mm -hmm. You can only do as much. But if you surround yourself with the right people, and you don't, you know that you don't. The, everybody around you knows that you don't condone any uh, disregard for rule of law. Uh, it was uh, Fermi Falano that said when Buhari was military head of state in 1984, 1985, he obeyed all court orders regardless. But now he, he cherry picks the government cherry picks the court orders to obey and not to obey. What so, changed in your assessment? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not drag that. But, yeah. but, but again, yeah, we need to pay the bills, isn't it? And yeah. leadership has to show that example uh, so that other systems can work. Yes, too. and and as a leader, like I said, you can you're only one person, but you surround yourself with the right people, and everything should be done strictly based on who is capable, not based on politics or sentiments or. I think if we have that kind of leader, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Nigeria will not just get better overnight. It takes uh, some time. It yeah. takes grinding for many things to change. But if we start the right thing, if we set things on the right trajectory, yeah. then we begin to see results. And it will only take um, a matter of time before we actually see big impacts mm -hmm. across the country. Okay, now let's talk um, economic diversification. There has been a lot of conversation, advocacies on economic diversification. But in your assessment, where are we at the moment? All right, like I said earlier, our GDP is diversified, highly diversified. Uh, the problem has been oil, and oil is less than 10% of our GDP. But in terms of our revenue and our foreign exchange earning, that's where we have a long way to go. And it has been a problem for a while. And um, we have failed so far at um, trying to diversify our income, government income, government revenue, and uh, foreign exchange earning away from oil. Oil still makes the larger chunk of, of these uh, two things. I, I think for foreign exchange earnings, we can make uh, diaspora remittances, for example. We can encourage Nigeria, Nigerians living abroad to send money to Nigeria and 
maybe if we allow them to vote, we allow them a say mm. in the way things are done in this country, maybe that will embolden them to send in money. Um, another thing is many Nigerians want to leave the country. I know it may not uh, seem good because um, some people that we need actually in this country are also going like doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. But um, our unemployment is high. I, I was discussing with somebody, a medical doctor, he finished his um, residency and the hospital could not detain him. I had problem uh, getting employment that, was, uh, that would pay uh, commensurate to his skill and he had to leave for Saudi Arabia and he's getting like five times what he would have gotten in Nigeria. Saudi has taken a lot yes. of our doctors. Yeah, yeah and so many other countries around the world. So uh, there are people that or like that person now he's not appreciated here his skill is not appreciated and he has gone to a place and he sends in money to his loved ones and that's good for uh, our foreign uh, exchange reserves. Um, besides that, uh, capital inflows, you have to encourage investments. I know a Niger Nigerian person will be junketing, uh, junketing around the world, that they're trying to invite uh, foreign investors. It goes beyond that. Mm. I think if, if I were the president today, I would stay behind, fix things, and you see foreign investments will come in. It's not about going around. People are reading news about insecurity in Nigeria, mm. high inflation, uh, foreign exchange instability and macroeconomic instability, and you think by talking to them, they will ignore the facts and listen to you and come and invest. People will not do that. So all these affect, you know, people uh, actually investing. Call it. Okay, finally, just yeah, briefly, uh, this just pops up. And, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, this is 2022, is eve of a general election. So uh, in terms of budget implementation, where do you see us? How far do you see us going? Uh, if you look at, you know, some of the and this is usually eve of elections is overtaken, you know, by politics and all of that. All right, like the 2021 budget, the minister said, um, I think the president was, the president should be my source, said they had 100% releases. Hmm. And for that was for capital expenditure okay. now. For the current, the minister said it was 70%. Some people were questioning that because they have not seen results. But the minister is the authority for now. I remember doing an interview on Radio Nigeria and he was asking me that, which one should they believe? I said, the minister for now. Unless if you have a superior authority, it's not just sitting down in your home to uh, write off what the minister has said. Maybe you call a superior authority or some an authority, an authority on a par with the ministers, right? So um, we have been hardly implementing our budget fully. And this year in particular, I think, uh, things would get overtaken by uh, elections. Uh, people, Tinubu recently uh, told us that he had told uh, President Buhari that he would be running for office, mm -hmm. and so many people are also warming up. So I think that would be the major uh, determinant for economic activities for this year. I know the, uh, the current president is not running for the election, so he may likely concentrate on governance. Right, instead of campaigning because he's not running, mm -hmm. but directly or indirectly, uh, the governance will be affected by the politician. And besides, uh, the, the, in, in American politics, when you're about to go, they call you a lame duck president. So uh, people, you don't have that authority and power as much as if you had so much time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the president has basically this year to implement a full budget year is only this year. So by next day, he can only do it partially. So if I were him, I would make the most of this year, despite the electioneering, despite the politicking. I think this is his last chance mm. to make the most of his um, tenure as president. Mm. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Samson Galadima, for joining us on the program today. We look forward to having you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, there you have it. They are always coming through with analysis on perspectives on national issues. Uh, daybreak uh, draws the curtain here today. Mm, quite we'll very, very interesting discussions today. Mm -hmm. And if you have missed, you can always catch up on our social media handles and also connect with us on our YouTube. You can always watch this live on Facebook and also live on YouTube. Thank you for watching. Join us again tomorrow for another time on the program. My name is Ayubelia. Bye for now. And I'm Zainab Bella. Thank you for watching.